Good morning. This service is for March the 29th. We welcome you to First Congregational United Church of Christ, a church where all are welcome. We welcome you today to our service of worship and we hope you find this time together inspiring and meaningful. And we keep everyone who's involved with the virus in our prayers in the weeks to come. I'd like to begin our time of worship with an opening prayer. Will you bow with me, please? Holy God, creator of life, you call us out of our dark places, offering us the grace of new life. When we see nothing but hopelessness, you surprise us with the breath of your spirit. Call us out of our complacency and routines. Set us free from our self-imposed bonds and fill us with your spirit of life, compassion, and peace. In the name of Jesus, your anointed one, we pray. Amen. Today's sermon is based upon the story of the raising of Lazarus, and we'd like to share that with you from a video that I found. I invite you to watch this with us. He said he would be put to death there. And that he would rise again. Martha, Martha, Martha and Mary, the sisters of your friend in Bethany, have sent me here to find you. Lazarus is very ill, near death. Go. Tell them I'll be there. Martha, Martha, he's coming! Martha, Martha is coming! He's rising! Let's rise! Lord, Lord, if you had been with us, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Because I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who has come into the world to give us eternal life. Where have you laid him? Come and see. Lord, Lord. I prayed and prayed for you to arrive. You could have kept Lazarus from dying. Take away the stone. But he's been dead four days, Master. His body must already be decaying. Take away the stone. Give me a hand. those who stand around me may believe that I am the resurrection and the life. 
and those who believe in me shall never die. I went down into the countries underneath the earth to the peoples of the past but you lifted my life from the pit Lord my God Lazarus come forth He that believes in me, but he were dead, yet shall he live. Will you bow with me? Almighty God, I humbly ask that may the words in my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts and minds that they might be acceptable in your sight. Help us to hear and to understand and to believe the words of the gospel, the words of good news, the words of life. Amen. There's a story that I recently heard in the last few days of a very young father. He came home from work and he was trying to be very conscientious and he was talking to his young son who was in about first grade. He was about six years old. And he had his son come and sit on his lap and he said, son, I want to talk to you for a moment. You know, you didn't have school, they've canceled school, and I just want to make certain you understand why. He says, sure, Dad, I understand why. And the dad says, oh, you do? And the son says, I sure do. The dad says, well, then tell me, why have they canceled school? And the son looked at his dad square in the eye and says, because they've run out of toilet paper, Dad. They're all out everywhere. So anyway, today's sermon features upon John chapter 11, which is the story of Lazarus and this resurrection, which you just heard on the video. And I'd like to share just a few thoughts of how that story might challenge us in our everyday and daily living in that. This is the seventh sign that we've talked about in John's gospel. This is the seventh sign which teaches various things about God that John, the author of that gospel, wants us to hear and to understand. Each one of those signs wants us to see and to hear who Jesus is, and so he calls them signs and not miracles in that way. That, that's, this is important because they want us to see that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And through believing that he's God's son, we might receive life, eternal life in that. If you look at John's gospel, the, the Jewish scriptures in that of which John is a part are very unique and that the center is an important part of a passage. And so when you look at the 21 chapters of John, there are 10 chapters before the raising of Lazarus, there's 10 chapters afterward. And in the middle, if you were to draw an X, it would fall right in the middle on the story of the raising of Lazarus. For you see, this is the most important part, and it also complements the theme that, Jesus, that John is trying to explain to us, and that's the story of resurrection by believing that Jesus is God's son. This story, if you notice where it follows in John's gospel, falls right before the passion story. And so this foreshadows what's going to happen with Jesus, namely that Jesus will be crucified and he will die and be in the tomb three days, then he will rise and come back to life. And so the story of Lazarus foreshadows what is going to happen with Jesus, but it also foreshadows each one of us because 
In this passage, we are Lazarus, for someday we will die, and through the power of the gospel, we will receive that gift of everlasting life. There's a few interesting things to notice as you go through this story. First is the place, the city of Bethany. It's located about two miles away from Jerusalem. And it's the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, two sisters and one brother. And these, we believe, were the very closest of friends to Jesus. These were ones who loved him very dearly and very much. And so this is strange that Jesus would wait two days longer then for him to come to see Lazarus, to try to make him well. But what it ends up doing is adding some suspense in the story, and it makes us ask the question, will Jesus get there in time before Lazarus passes away? And that. In verse 16, a little bit later on, we encounter the person Thomas. And I always think that this part is kind of interesting because it presents a different side of Thomas than what we know of or what we're used to in this way. They're wanting to go down toward Bethany, which is near Jerusalem. And the scribes and the Pharisees are in Jerusalem for Passover. They want to kill Jesus. And the disciples asked him about not going because it's not safe. And Thomas, whose name in Greek is Didymus, which means the twin, so obviously he had a twin brother. But Thomas says, let us go that we might die with him. And to me, that's so different from doubting Thomas that we've always called him because of his doubts in the post-resurrection story. But Thomas says, let us go that we might die with him. To me, that's a statement of courage and a way in which it shows the true faith that Thomas has. In verse 35, as we move further down into the story, we find the shortest verse in the New Testament. And I think that's important. You didn't see this so much in the video, but the verse simply says, Jesus wept. And even though that verse is short, I think it has a very powerful impact in our story because it presents a God of compassion. Here's Lazarus, here's Jesus, whose best friend Lazarus has passed away. And yet it simply says he wept. I wonder sometimes when we stand there at a service or visitation, we come up and we see a loved one, a best friend, and we see the tears flowing and the grief that we feel. I wonder if it might help us in a way to remember that God is there crying with us. He's not asking what we did wrong to cause us. He's crying with us because his heart breaks as ours does. For it helps us we remember that God lost his own son too, who was crucified. And I'm certain that God felt the anger, the rage, the grief that all of us feel when we lose someone that way. As you saw in the video, Jesus stands there and he prays and then he commands Lazarus to come forth. If we were to read that text precisely in the Greek, he would be saying, Lazarus, Anastasia. That Greek word does not come forth, but it means resurrect. And so literally he's saying, Lazarus, resurrect, come forth that way. So it's interesting to note how the, how the words are changed there just a little bit. So how does this story then relate to our church today, a First Congregational United Church of Christ? I think our task as a church is to do what Jesus said at the very end of that story of that video, is to go and to untie him that he might be free and to go and to live, to unbind him and to take off the burial cloths, the bands that he has there. You know, there's, each church has a certain DNA of what makes it special. And I think one of the things that makes it special is how much we believe in education for our children and that at this church. We offer our Hearts and Hands preschool that started about 11 years ago. We have a space that we've had for close to 50 years at this church for Head Start program of allowing people who live in a lower income way of life to have a chance to have an equal start with others in kindergarten. And we provide them lunch and, and breakfast when they come here and eat because many of the children have not been fed at home. And so it's important that they have good nutrition and a good chance to learn. We also offer a space for our GED programs, maybe for some high school kids who have made some bad choices. And in that way, it allows them to continue on and to get the credits that they need for high school that they might graduate, receive a diploma, and have a better chance in life, one that's filled with greater opportunities because they have that diploma. I, I think our church works hard to offer that value of education because we believe that when we take off those binds and wrappings of ignorance, then we can allow that person to have new life and to have a greater opportunity of life, to have a much fuller life in that way. 
I think also our church works hard to support various programs in the community, such as Habitat for Humanity or even Family Promise. We offer volunteers where we help to feed. We, we stay with the people when they come here to our church. We allow them the space in our Sunday school room to set up cots to sleep and to watch the TVs that are down there with their kids. And we allow them a safe space to come in where it's warm and where it's safe and where they're off the streets. That's so important. And I believe that we as a church then are unwrapping those binds and those wrappings called homelessness. And we're allowing them a safe place to stay, a way where they can learn and develop the skills to go back into society and to live in a home of their own. That's so important to do. But I think for many, many years and through a variety of people, including myself, we've offered pastoral care to families. It's so important, not just to the members of our church, but also to, to our friends and our neighbors, those that we know and that we love and that we care about in that way. And we're, when people are facing the final stages of their life here on earth, we walk with them. We provide a loving presence as Christ did with us. And we unwrap that binding called death and we remind them of the promises of eternal life. And that's so important because that's part of the gospel that we feel. How does this verse speak then to us as individuals? First of all, it speaks to us and that we are Lazarus in that story. That if we believe that Jesus is God's son, we too will rise from the dead and receive that gift of everlasting life that's so wonderful. But I'd like to close with this last story. A few years ago, I attended a conference in North Carolina that was held by the Billy Graham Association. And one of the presenters told a story. He was an excellent speaker. And he says, one day they went down, there was a group that went down into Nicaragua. And there was a soldier down there that they met. And he was part of the Contra army. And his job was to kill people. He was an assassin. And he did this many times over a long time. And one day a missionary went and talked with him and told him about the love that Jesus has for him. And after he heard that, he went and he resigned from the army that way. And then he changed his name to Lazarus. When asked why he changed his name, he told them, because I was dead and now I am alive. Jesus gave me a new life, and now I am a new person. That's my challenge that I would like to leave with you today. Share the love of Christ. Help those around you to find a new life, to step out of those burial wrappings, out of those bindings which keeps them tied to death and life, whether it might be addiction or whatever it might be, and allow them that one day they might be able to say, my name is Lazarus because I was dead, but now I am alive. That's our challenge for you this day. Amen. I would like to call us to a time of prayer, but first I'd like to ask you to remember the family of Joanne Buck, who passed away um, a few days back. The arrangements are still uncertain at this time due to the various quarantines and restrictions due to the virus that we have. And I would also like to encourage all of you to pray for the victims those who have passed, for the families who have lost loved ones, for those who are ill, for the frontline medical people who are assisting and taking care of these people, for all concerned with the virus, for all of them need your prayers very much during this time. Could I ask you please to bow your heads and your hearts with me as we talk to God this morning. Let us pray. Gracious God, you're the God of all compassion and consolation. Your breath alone brings life to dry bones and weary souls. Pour out your spirit upon us that we may face despair and death with the hope of the resurrection and with faith through our Christ, our Lord. Help us to dance with the spirit, to breathe in the breath of life, which calls us out of the valley of dry bones and into the kingdom of God, which is both a present reality and the grounding of our future hope. Almighty God, you revealed the way of life through your Son, Jesus Christ. Inscribe your law on our hearts that is in this life, that we may be the body of Christ. Help our hands to hold the sick and the suffering. Help our feet to walk with the poor. Help our ears to listen to those who live in despair. Help our ears to be fixed upon the suffering of the cross and the hope of the empty tomb, that we too may live as a resurrected people. Sovereign Lord, God of all and the power of the Holy Spirit, you know our faults and yet you promise to forgive. Keep us in your presence and give us your wisdom. 
open our hearts to gladness, command our dry bones to dance, and restore to us the joy of your salvation. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, as we continue to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now come out, Jesus, for Jesus calls us from the tombs of our existence into the brightness of a new day. Come out, Jesus Christ, to unbind us from the chains of our past. Come out, Jesus invites us, into a world filled with grace and possibility. So go out into a world that needs our life, our breath, and our spirit. Go out now into a world that needs the Spirit of God carried in our loving arms. Go out into the world to live as God's resurrected people and go out and be filled with the breath of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>